Good morning. I'm Dr. Andrea Rapkin, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at UCLA. And I'm Kana Cassard, Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist and Sex Therapist based out of Los Angeles, California. Today we're going to start a conversation on mind-body treatments for vulvodynia. I'm going to present some of the rationale or importance for why we would include mind-body approaches in the treatment of vulvodynia, and Kane is going, to, is going to go into some more detail about how this is done. So what is vulvodynia? Vulvodynia is chronic pain, meaning pain of more than three months duration, occurring in the tissues in the surrounding the vagina or in the opening of the vagina. It affects up to 15% of women, and it's a very common condition. We make the diagnosis initially by taking history and then performing a very detailed physical examination to rule out other causes of, an, of pain, such as infection, hormone deficiency, skin conditions, and specific nerve injuries. Once we've ruled out those conditions, we come to the diagnosis of vulvodynia. And with the diagnosis of vulvodynia, we then define the pain as localized, generalized, or what causes the pain, whether it's spontaneous or whether it occurs only with contact. The most common form of vulvodynia is actually called vestibulodynia, meaning pain in these tissues at the entrance of the vagina. And it's also called provoked vestibulodynia, PVD, formerly called vulvar vestibulitis. Now this condition is the most common cause of pain with sex in reproductive age women. But what is the link between your brain and your pain? Vulvodynia is associated with neurological changes. It is actually a neurologically based disorder. For example, in the vulvar tissue, the excess sensitivity in the vestibule has been shown in studies to be linked to an increase in the density of nerve fibers in that area. And then if we look at areas related to the central nervous system or brain and spinal cord, studies have shown that women with vestibulodynia have an increased sensitivity to painful stimuli applied to other areas of the body during the research studies, such as the shoulder, the shin, uh, or even the thumb, pressing the thumb. In addition, research groups, including our group, looking uh, with functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, have been able to show that there are functional changes at the level of the brain, specifically in the connectivity of regions related to pain. So what's the difference between acute and chronic pain? Why would this happen in chronic pain situations? Because we know that acute pain is originally adaptive. It's a good idea if you've injured yourself to withdraw, to relax, to protect the area. But over time, these reflexes become maladaptive. So over time, if the pain persists, it is called chronic. And chronic pain can be kept going by chemical and physiological changes in the spinal cord and brain without any ongoing inflammation in the vulvar vaginal tissues. Then we have muscle reflexes. In this situation, we're talking about muscle reflexes in the vagina and the pelvic floor. These muscles protect us. They tighten up, but again, over time, they add to the pain. So even when only minor tissue changes have persisted before or are currently present, the brain still tries to protect us by magnifying these nerve signals. This chemical magnification is called upregulation and the upregulation of the central nervous system persists after tissues have healed. So what happens? Various systems in our body go on high alert. These systems can be triggered by the upregulated central nervous system. So initially this is adaptive to help us heal, but over time becomes maladaptive and actually perpetuates the pain. Chronic pain and stress alter body systems. So on a chemical basis, studies have shown that the immune system, the sympathetic nervous system, and the endocrine system all get in on the act. The immune system begins to produce chemicals that amplify pain. You might have heard terms such as prostaglandins, cytokines, and nerve growth factors that affect and upregulate pain. And in the sympathetic nervous system, adrenaline or epinephrine, the fight or flight hormone, ramps up our responses. 
And finally, the endocrine system, the adrenal gland, is stimulated by the brain to produce more cortisol. And over time, too much cortisol can lead to fatigue, even to irregular periods, and to depression. And pain is a very distressing sensation. It is different from other types of sensations. Pain alters our feelings. We worry about the meaning of the pain, and we become afraid that the pain will never go away. And pain makes us change our behavior as well. We try to protect the part of the body that hurts, and we avoid many activities. So to summarize, chronic vulvar pain is not just a nerve sensation coming from the vulvar tissue, but it's an experience. And this experience is altered by behaviors, muscle reflexes, and the CNS upregulation. But the good news is these are plastic changes. In other words, they're shapeable and malleable. They're not like a disease of the brain. And we can unwind. Now, Kane is going to tell us how we can unwind these no longer adaptive systems. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. So before we launch into that, just on a personal note, I wanted to share that I was actually a patient of Dr. Rapkin's years and years ago, and it was Dr. Rapkin and the team at UCLA who helped me understand that there was a mind-body connection to overcoming my pain. And while my tissues and the muscle structures were on their growth to healing, I realized that I hadn't addressed the stress or the anxiety component, and so my, I was sort of stag, stagnated in my treatment. Once I started to get my anxiety and stress under control, then I had a lot more um, positive results and became pain-free and was able to manage flare-ups as they came on. So the very first thing to understand is what is a mind-body connection? So basically the mind-body connection is understanding and bringing an awareness of what's going on inside of the mind, thoughts and beliefs that are going on, and starting to connect it to the body and starting to bring the body into the awareness, into the present moment awareness when we're thinking about thoughts or we're having feelings or anxieties or pain experiences. The first component to know and understand about the mind-body experience is the nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system regulates and controls most every function of our, of our bodies. It helps, um, having nervous system regulation helps us decrease anxiety, manage stress, and even manage pain as well. So this is sort of a simplistic view for today's purposes, but there are two branches of the autonomic nervous system. There's the sympathetic branch, or the flight or fight response, and then there is the parasympathetic branch, which is the rest and digest. So the sympathetic nervous response, when we're feeling threatened, either physically or psychologically, there's a whole host of body changes that occur in order to prepare us to defend ourselves or keep our, ourselves safe. And then with the parasympathetic, this is where we recover from when we activate the parasympathetic or when it is activated, we're able to recover from the stress response. As it relates to vulvodynia and other pain disorders, when we look at the organs that are impacted or the muscle um, expression that's impacted, there is a contraction of the vaginal muscles, there's a limitation of the blood flow, and then also there are more stress chemicals that are released that over time can cause tissue inflammation. So if, if somebody's in a chronic state of sympathetic response, then they're chronically experiencing tight muscles and um, nerve inflammation. So while we, we need both of these branches, both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic, to be acting in a healthy balance together, and if they're not, then what happens is we get a dysregulated system and there's chronic stress of the autonomic nervous system. A lot of people, especially a lot of women that I've worked with, express that they have been able to tolerate the chronic stress that they experience. And while it can produce a lot of um, great work because somebody is really focused on doing their work and being a mom and managing the household, what ends up happening is that they become a highly stressed individual and it relates that information back into the body. So I've had clients who have actually labeled themselves as type A or uh, perfectionistic or just uh, a chronic producer. And um, this just seems to be a common thread. So it helped me understand more of the link of chronic stress and how it plays into the role of vulvodynia. So this can also cause other chronic pain issues, other diseases, um, irritable bowel syndrome, and just overall 
uh, chronic fatigue and stress in the body. So one other thing to understand is how we get stuck in a dysregulated state. So I've already talked about one, just having chronic stress uh, can be a major component to it. But also, when the nervous system or when the person feels like they are powerless or overwhelmed um, or experience something of too much, too fast, too soon, the nervous system remembers the situation, the situation that they're experiencing in which they feel powerless. The nervous system remembers that situation and starts to log it as a threatening experience. So then our, our brain and our body starts to remember those situations specifically, but then they also start to widen the understanding of what is threatening to other situations as well. So for instance, if a woman has pain during intercourse, the brain and the body might start to link pain, sex with pain. But then it also might start to widen the, the view and notice that, well, every time my husband comes toward me and tries to hold my hand or gives me a kiss, he wants sex, and then sex leads to pain. So now the body and the nervous system will actually start to register as any sort of intimate approach from the husband might mean pain as well. And so there's an avoidance that the body puts out. So there are also some other ways that might impact or create a nervous system dysregulation. And this might be trauma, so some sort of an overt trauma like physical abuse um, or sexual abuse, but there also might be, um, and we call those little, like little T, sorry, big T traumas. We call those big T traumas. The little T traumas are ones that we're not usually expecting to be considered as a trauma, but we're seeing that the nervous system reacts in the same way as the big T traumas. So the little T traumas might be that chronic stress, chronic pain, uh, experiences of neglect or abandonment at a young age, or even a sex negative culture or oppressive messages around sexuality. So our body and our brain starts to register that these experiences can be a threat to the system psychologically or physically. So one of the ways to manage vulvodynia and other pain disorders is from a mind-body experience, from a mind-body approach might be developing a sense of self-efficacy. So self-efficacy is basically the belief that you can do something and do it well and that you can rely on yourself to do it. So there, while there is a cause for the pain, there might be a cause for the pain such as infection or hormone imbalance or um, any sort of other inflammation, and that might be out of our control, there is a component that is within our control. So the way that we respond to the situation, the way we respond to chronic stress or the pain is something that is a little bit more in our control as is our ability to regulate our nervous system. And so we want to increase the ability to manage that pain and exert a feeling of empowerment. And so the reason we want to do that is because if somebody is highly activated, if they're highly stressed, then they might exacerbate the pain experience. So imagine a woman who has no anxiety about the pain or any worry about it. She might report her pain as a 5 out of 10, but if you start to insert a highly activated nervous system, she might then express that she's experiencing a pain level of 8 out of 10. So it's just a quick example of how it how a dysregulated nervous system can actually activate the pain experience a little bit more. So if we're building the belief that we have control over the pain and our response to pain, then we also start to experience the result of our efforts. And the impact that this has is we start to feel like we're being less controlled by our pain and we're not hijacked by the pain any, any longer. So how can we take control back? One of the ways is to start to build resiliency. And while, and then also regulate the nervous system. And while those two things might seem simple enough, they're not easy to do. And so it takes a lot of practice, but it's okay, you can do it. So research has shown that negative emotions increase our experience of pain. What we have found is that when there are feelings that are negative, such as anxiety or uh, sadness or anger, those areas of the brain that are activated when those emotions are activated are also activating the same areas that our pain is being activated in. So an increase in anxiety and sadness might also activate the areas of our brain that are related to pain, and so it exacerbates the situation. One technique and tool that I help use with my clients is describing this resilience zone that was developed by the Trauma Resource Institute. 
So if you think about somebody having a zone, a resilience zone of this wide, versus somebody who has a resilience zone of this wide, if a stressful situation comes in and it's, you know, it's about that much, this person can tolerate the activation of that stressful situation. But for a person who has a smaller or more narrow resilience zone and this stressful situation creates activation that's outside of their resilience zone, they start to experience a dysregulated nervous system. So we can actually deepen, widen the resilience zone, and then also help people get back into the resilient zone utilizing several skills. Some of those skills that I like to include are mindfulness, um, this mind-body connection, and then also CBT skills by helping create an awareness around the thought process that's occurring in the mind and providing alternative possibilities through either questioning oneself, saying, is there another reason that my husband is approaching me and wanting to hold my hand? Um, we might bring to mind that there are other alternatives, like, oh, maybe he just wants to be close to me, and that's it. Not, he always wants sex, and so therefore my body goes into a state of dysregulation. So we can start to question those situations. Some other, some other techniques is creating the mindfulness or the awareness around uh, the high activation and the resiliency zone. So we want to start building the resiliency to deepen or to widen that zone, and genuine laughter is one of the best ways to do that. So having playfulness, having um, fun, you know, the big belly laughters that we love having and, and experiencing. Um, we also can have other positive affects. So, th so uh, this is what I call building a resource. So a resource is anything that brings us peace, joy, happiness, and then starting to notice the sensations that happen inside of our body. So that's bringing the awareness on to the body sensations of joy and of um, internal resource. And this starts to lower the pain experience and increase the pain thresholds. So when you start to notice the neutral or pleasant sensations in the body, that helps reduce the pain experience and manage pain more better. Another way to take control back is to uh, by using these internal resources that have been built, we also start to create new neuropathways and start to bring that neuroplasticity that Dr. Epkin had talked about earlier. And it allows us to be more flexible, more creative, and more open in possibilities, which then ultimately translates to our ability to the self-efficacy, our ability to believe that we can take control back. And this ends up undoing the negative physical or physiological responses that occur from having had pain experiences or negative emotions. Here are a list of some really wonderful options that people can use to help manage their pain. So engaging in acts of kindness, doing a gratitude journal um, or gratitude experiences such as writing uh, three, three things that you're grateful for at the end of the day and doing a loving kindness meditation or listing strengths and values. And then in a broader sense or more general sense, identifying purpose and passion in life, which is something that often tends to be a challenge for women who have experienced pain because they've had an identity crisis or they're not really sure what it means to be a partner and a woman if they're having this kind of pain. And so starting to explore those, those areas of ways you can create meaning in life the key part to all of these things is to notice the sensations that happen in the body as you do these activities. So as you do a loving kindness meditation and you might experience like, oh, that feels really nice and I'm doing this loving kindness. Well, where does it feel really nice in your body? Where, where do you feel that sense of calm or that sense of peace? And you might just feel just a tiny little bit, but that's okay because the more times that you spend focusing on the little glimmers of resiliency or of resource, the more and more it starts to expand. For a lot of women who've experienced pain, it's actually very difficult to do some of the things I just suggested. And so I bring this up now to help women who have a difficulty going into their body or noticing the sensations that are happening inside of their body because their body has been a place of so much pain and sorrow and betrayal even that starting to notice any sensations going on can actually create more anxiety and exacerbate the dysregulation. So this is a technique that actually can be used for somebody who's starting to feel maybe even a little bit worse when they notice neutral or positive sensations in their body. So this might be a stepping stone. Basically utilizing any of your five senses to bring you into the present moment, utilizing an external resource. So one that I usually recommend is taking like those tangelos, those cuties that are like really fun to open up. 
the, um, the like orange mix, uh, the orange mix between the tangelos. And you start to like peel into it, you feel the sensation, you smell, you smell it, you listen to it as you peel into it. And you just start to notice all of the sensations as it relates to that moment and that present awareness. So this can be a great resource as a way to expand your present moment experience, which then ultimately deepens the resilience zone and allows you to get back in because it's a really grounding experience. So as a summary, basically when we take these science-based science -based information about what's going on inside of our bodies, we can actually utilize skills and apply it to our everyday life. And this isn't just about thinking positively and the vulvodynia will go away. Naturally, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be discussed and explored um, with a professional or with a close friend or trusted friend or partner, um, because that, that is important in overcoming vulvodynia as well. But there are, um, there are many components of healing and treating vulvodynia. And so we take a biopsychosocial approach, which is like a whole overall big picture. And it's really important to make sure to bring these tools on board with medical and, and uh, physical treatment with, like, with the PT or with Dr. Rapkin. And this, is, this whole goal is to just create an overall mind-body wellness. So we're going to have questions now. Dr. Rapkin's going to join me. And I guess I'll just hold on to this. And the questions are there. Thank you. Yeah. So the first question, what causes vulvodynia? And the answer to that is we don't quite know, but we're doing a lot of research in this area. And as I mentioned, we know that there are neurologically based changes. We don't know what they're triggered by. It could have been triggered by a yeast infection. It could have been triggered by uh, a time of uh, painful intercourse or possibly a long history of tight pelvic floor muscles. We don't really know the cause. But luckily, without knowing the cause, we can still unwind and treat the problem. Excellent. So I think this one actually a little bit uh, piggybacks off of what you're just saying. That can you explain the relationship between pelvic floor dysfunction and vulvodynia? And um, it can kind of, pelvic floor dysfunction, the hypertonic pelvic floor, can cause vulvodynia. And then as a result of some vulvodynia uh, that might be as a result of infections could then end up causing muscle tightness because of the muscles trying to protect uh, the vulvar tissue. So it's kind of like a chicken or egg situation, but addressing the pelvic floor dysfunction with a PT can help relieve the vulvodynia symptoms. And then also treating the vulvodynia symptoms can help with the pelvic floor dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of how is vulvodynia treated, as part of the assessment, we determine what are the most salient or important factors that are currently going on in the tissues. And as Kana mentioned, pelvic floor physical therapy is a very important component. So all of the pelvic floor muscles are examined for their tone, their tightness, their ability to relax, and for pain. And luckily, we have some very experienced colleagues, professionals, who are specifically pelvic floor physical therapists. And these, uh, these women, the physical therapists, are um, a part of our team and a very important component. And then we have other treatments specifically related to the tissue. We have creams or medications that lower the pain threshold, that alter abnormally functioning nerves in that area. And also, if the tissue looks thin and looks like it's lacking hormones, say from being on long-term birth control pills or other hormonal contraceptives, which can happen in some women, we may apply topical estrogen and or testosterone to thicken up the tissue and decrease the hyperactive nerves. And as uh, Kana mentioned, of course, the mind-body approaches. And sometimes surgery is needed, but this is uncommon when there is a proliferation or an excess of nerve endings in the vestibule and the other treatments do not seem to have been effective and are not playing a role any longer. Sometimes we actually surgically remove the little piece of tissue of the vestibule and bring the vagina out as new tissue to cover that area. And that can be very effective as well. So I think the last one we have is, can yoga benefit people with vulvodynia? And absolutely. It absolutely can because the focus of yoga is about bringing the mindfulness to uh, our physical experience as well as to our mental experience and helping relax the body and the mind when in a 
maybe stressful situations such as a difficult pose. So it's, it's a great carryover, but it's not always for everybody and that's okay, except for the fact that I say, or I've heard my, some of my favorite teachers say that um, if you're thinking mindfully about your breath and your movement, you're doing yoga. So maybe it is for everybody. And I think that's all the questions that we have here. And thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you.